So welcome everybody. Wednesday, April 7, Math 208, our statistics class. And I got some really nice examples for you today of the chi-square distribution. Last time we did an example of what was called goodness of fit. And today we're gonna to do another example called test of independence. And these two examples are really very similar. The chi-square distribution is when you want to know if things are matching what you observed and what you expected. So notice we've collected several distributions so far. We have the standard normal distribution. We have the T distribution. Now we have the chi-squared distribution. Resembles the T distribution in a way of setting up that it has degrees of freedom. That standard normal distribution is a beautiful bell shape. The T distribution is a kind of a wider, flatter bell shape, but still symmetric. Chi-square distribution is the first distribution we've used that it's literally not symmetric. It's kind of rises to a height early and declines slowly. Now we got one more distribution we're gonna learn in this class. It's called the F distribution, but I'll save that for later. So what are distributions for? Distributions are for testing things. And you could make yourself a list of what things you can test with what distributions. You should probably compile that list because we've gone through several tests now. But the chi-square distribution tests for goodness of fit. Does a distribution you are given match the distribution you were expected, you were expecting? And even test of independence is very much like this. Does the information you are given match the information you are expecting if two events are independent. We'll start out with an example, but I'm speaking very generally now. You create a test statistic and then you check the area after that test statistic on the distribution. You do this in all these tests. See how much area you have in the distribution and decide whether that's significant or not significant. So for the chi-square test, the test statistic says you take the observed values minus the expected values one at a time, square each dividing by each expected value. So in some sense, if I say this in plain English, what you're adding up is the differences or the errors or the differences from what you expect. And if the things you observe and the things you expect are very close, then this test statistic is gonna be relatively small and you're gonna cut out a significant area in this distribution. And in that case, you're gonna stay with your assumption that events are independent. If the test statistic is large, if some of these observed values and expected values make up a significant number, then the test statistic is gonna be farther to the right on the chi-square distribution and this area captured will be small. And that means that you might have less area than your level of significance. Maybe this is a very rare thing if these two categories are independent. So you reject the null hypothesis and you conclude that there's sufficient evidence to assume that the two categories are dependent. So, I'm gonna talk about the test of independence today and give you some examples. But the hypotheses, when you're testing for independence, I need one more syllable. Your default assumption is the categories or classes, the things that are being described are independent. That's gonna be your base position. 
if someone says, oh, the color car you drive is dependent on your age, you're going to say, well, prove it to me. Give me some information that proves that. You're going to be naturally suspicious. You're going to assume that those two things are independent until someone shows you significant evidence otherwise. So in a test for independence, test of independence, you assume first the null hypothesis, the categories are independent unless someone brings you significant evidence that they depend on each other. The alternative hypothesis would be the categories are dependent or not independent, if you want to say it like that. Uh, the kind of car you drive depends on your age. I could easily believe that. Now, I'm only talking about my opinion until someone gives me facts, but you know, older, you're gonna drive this more comfortable car, you're gonna drive this more expensive car, maybe like a Cadillac, a Lincoln, a Buick. But younger, maybe you got that sports coupe, maybe you got that Ford Focus, maybe you got that Mazda Miata, if you're lucky. I, I just say that because I don't have a Mazda Miata, but it's kind of like my dream car. It's kind of like a cute car. So if someone brings you significant evidence that those categories are independent, then you'd be willing to believe that. Okay, so let's hop right into an example. And I am gonna show you some, and, and this is gonna be largely performed on the calculator. So I'll say in this test, the calculator will do a great deal of the work. In fact, almost all of the work. But I will show you some shortcuts on your calculator if you want to verify things yourself. And the book also instructs you how to use the calculator. So let's look at an example. And I'm gonna start off with example 11.7 in the book. And I'm gonna read it to you and fill in a table for you. And I essentially want to know, does the need to succeed in school Is that need to succeed, succeed in school independent or dependent on the anxiety you have, anxiety you have about courses and grades? Let's take a look at this. You need to succeed in school and you can choose the level of school you choose. Uh, maybe we choose college right now. Why do you need to succeed in school? You wanna get a job, you want to get good grades, you want to get a scholarship, any of these things like that. And does that mean you're very anxious about your success rate and your grades in school? That's very believable that that would be the case. You know, I'd be willing to believe that just because I've talked to a lot of students while teaching. I was a student. I remember how anxious I was about grades and courses. So I think I'm willing to believe this straight up right now. But what if we asked for some data? 
So in section 11 point uh, three, in example 11.7, he gives you this data. Let's make a table where the first column is the need to succeed. And the first row is the anxiety level. I'm writing a little bit small here, but this table is in your book. And what's important is the numbers I'm going to write down. It's not necessarily these terms. You can read the terms in the book, in this section. Let's say your need to succeed is either high, medium, or low. That's very generic, but makes sense. Let's say your anxiety level, they give anxiety level in five categories, high, medium high, medium, medium low, and low. And then they fill in the results of a survey or the results of some information they collected. People that had a high need to succeed and a high anxiety, they surveyed 280 students and I'm gonna fill in the numbers they found. High need to succeed and medium high anxiety, 42 people identified with that. So I'm literally filling in the numbers from the book. Now, usually I wouldn't copy numbers from a book, but I want to show you a shortcut you can do on your calculator. And so it would be handy to have these written down on the camera in front of us when we need them. So what you're doing, reading or copying, I don't mind which way you do it, but I'm gonna copy these. High need to succeed and low anxiety. They only found 10 people that identified with that out of two, oh, out of 400 people they surveyed. Now, also when I'm finishing this table, I could add up the amount in each column and I could add up the amount in each row I'm going to use the numbers that they said when they added these. I checked to see if they added them correctly, and they did. When they added each row, they got 155. These are the row totals. One ninety three. And 52. These row totals must add up to 400, and they do. These column totals must add up to 400, and they do. So we've accounted for 400 people here, and they told us whether they need to succeed in school was high, medium, or low, and then they told us what their anxiety level was about that from high to low with five categories, high, medium, medium, high, medium, high, medium, and medium, low, and low. Now, the trouble is, if you think about this, look at the people that have a high need to succeed in a high anxiety level. 35 people had a high anxiety level and a high need to succeed. 57 people total had a high anxiety level. But when you look at 35 out of 57, that's a big amount. That's more than 50%, certainly. But you go over here to the row totals, high need to succeed 155. And all people the survey were 400. So the people with high anxiety level more often said they had a high need to succeed. 
I'm comparing it against these row totals at the end. What proportion of 57 people should say that they had a high anxiety level if it matched the proportion of the overall number? That's pretty easy to calculate. I take 155 divided by 400. So ordinarily 38.75% of the people said they had a high need to succeed. And if I check the people that had a high anxiety, I take that fraction, 38.75% times 57 people. I don't think I'm gonna get 35 people. So this is the proportion, this is the amount of people I expect should say they had a high anxiety level. 38%, 39% of 57 is 22.0875, not 35. So what am I thinking? Maybe the people with a high need to succeed are also high anxiety level. I could also do this at the low end, 155 out of 400 had a high need to succeed, but only 10 out of 58 said they had low anxiety about it. So what if I took that 155 divided by 400 and multiplied it by 58? If the proportion was ordinary, I'd expect this to be maybe 22.475. Okay, so now this is what we're about to do. Get another colored pen here. This is what my survey told me. This is what I observed. But I'm going to make another table to describe what I expected. So let's make the same table. And this is the reason I'm writing it down so that you can see the two tables side by side and judge for yourself what the differences are. So you have to be patient with me why I reset up this table, but there'll be a good payoff. The good payoff is gonna be, I'll show you how to totally automate this on your calculator so that you don't have to always write this out. So I go through my categories, high, medium, high, medium, medium, low, and low. And I would still have column totals and row totals that add up to 400. In other words, I don't want to contradict the people the, the idea that I asked 400 people for their opinion. And among those, 57 said they had high anxiety, 95 said they had medium high anxiety, 127, 63, 58, and need to succeed in school. 155 said they needed to succeed, 193 said that was a medium need, and 52 said that was a low need. So remember, this columns, or the, the rows here have a category need to succeed. And the columns are marked by anxiety level. But here, I'm not gonna fill in the results of my survey. I'm gonna fill in what I expected. In other words, by proportion, 155 to 400, I expected of 57 people that I'd have 22.09 that said they had a high anxiety level. Of the 155 out of 400 that I had a high need to succeed, I expected that out of 58 people, I'd have 22.48 that had a low anxiety level. And then I notice as I compare to my survey, that number is less than I got in my survey. That number is much more than I got in my survey. 
maybe high need to succeed is connected to high anxiety level. Maybe the higher my need to succeed, the higher my anxiety level, the lower my need to succeed, the lower my anxiety level. Well, that's where we're gonna check it out. Now, the problem is, do you see I have 15 numbers in this table? Don't think about the totals yet. The totals are just facts. But I wanna check the difference between observed and expected. These are my O's, observed values. These are my expected values in this table. I wanna check out the difference in all 15 of these boxes. Now, that could be intimidating if you say you're gonna calculate this one at a time on the calculator, 15 calculations. Not impossible, but it's gonna take you a little while. So rather than show you how to do it one at a time on the calculator, I will show you how to automate this on a calculator in two ways. Medium fast way, and then super fast way. Now just for vocabulary right here, when I make a table of numbers, earlier we called that in our probability section, a contingency table. It was a table breaking people down in different categories. You can also, there's a fancy math word for a table. It's called a matrix. A matrix is the math word for a table of numbers. Now I'm going to go to the calculator. I got my calculator screen up and I'm about to share it with you. Let me. I'm um, gonna get calculator screen is blocking something else. So excuse me. I'm gonna have to open up a different screen. So hang on just a second while I get calculator screen open on a different screen. What I wanna do is calculate these one row at a time. I wanna calculate these fast. So let me show you how to do that. Clear. Now I can share the calculator screen with you. Got my calculator up. So on my calculator, in the first row, I have 155 out of 400 people in that first row. What I want to do is take that ratio, 155 times 400, and multiply it by each of these numbers. Now, instead of doing five multiplications one at a time, the calculator has a way for you to do all five at once. And that is you go like this, 155 divided by, excuse me, 155 divided by 400, and now times, and look above the eight and nine where the parentheses are on your calculator. There's also in blue, some curly parentheses called braces. So what I'm gonna do is, instead of a parentheses, don't use a parentheses, use the curly brace, use second function parentheses to get the curly brace, and then enter these five numbers on the bottom row. And then I'll multiply 155 times 400 times all five of those numbers at once. Put commas in between, 57 comma, 95 comma, 127 comma, 63 comma, 58. And now in the curly braces, second function parentheses ends the curly braces. Now when I hit enter, watch this, I'll get five numbers, I'll get the whole five numbers in that row. Notice the first number is 22.09. The second number is 36.81. Let me make sure I got my connection working here. The third number is sliding off the screen. I'll just round to two decimal places, but I can use an arrow key to go 49.21. And the last number, 24.41.
And notice the last number multiplying by 58 is 22.48, which I already knew. Okay, very good. So what I did is like speed filled that row. Now let me speed fill the second row using some shortcuts. Do second function entry. Now that gives me the 155 times 400 times all these people. I want the same numbers, 57, 95, 127, 6, 3, 58, but I don't want 55 here. I want 193. So I'll just put 193 there and then multiply. Hit enter. And now I speed filled this row. I'll write it on my paper, even though I'm kind of sharing the calculator screen. 2750, 4584. Arrow over, 61.28. I can show you how to show less decimal places so you don't have to arrow over so much too later. 30.39, but you round up to 30.40. And now 27.99. I'll look at these numbers carefully in a second. Too many decimal places kinds of obscures things, I understand. So now let's do the last row speed fill. Instead of 193, I want to change that to 52 divided by 400. So I type 52 and then I delete that three, hit the delete key. There's my multiplication, 7.41. Twelve point three five, sixteen point five one. Fifteen is give me, sorry, eight point one nine, and seven point five four. Okay, now I'll show you a different way to make this even faster in a second. But now let's go back to my paper and compare the expected table in blue to the observed table in red. First, look at the medium line. 1827, 48, 45, 63, 61, 33, 30, 31, 28. You know, that medium row is not very different from my survey. Maybe those are the middle of the road people. They don't have a high need or a no need to succeed. So their anxiety level is matching what I expected it to match from the table. But look at the high row, 35 way over 22, 42 over 36, 53 over 49, 15 instead of 24. See, these numbers on the left side are way higher and as I go across, the number on the right side is way lower. I think the people with high need to succeed have a high anxiety level, it seems. Let's look at the low row. Low, four is under seven, five is under 12, 11 is under 16, 15 is more than eight, 17 is way more than seven. Yeah, I think the people with low need to succeed have a low anxiety level much more than I expected. So I do think that high need to succeed, the need to succeed is definitely depending on anxiety level. They are dependent, I believe, but I'm gonna do a calculator test to do it for sure. Now, what's the calculator test? This is the hard part. I've got 15 different numbers to compare I've got to subtract all 15, squaring each and dividing by each expected value. So I'm going to take 35 minus 2209, square it, and then divide by 2209. That's going to give me another table. But there's no way I want to write that out. So I can have the calculator perform the difference between these two tables square the difference between the two tables in each box, and then divide by the blue expected values in each box. 
I'm going to have the calculator do all that for me at once. So let's write this down. I'll show you the steps on the calculator. So what I have for my null hypothesis is that need to succeed is independent of anxiety level. The numbers tell me that maybe it's not independent, but remember, you gotta prove it to me. You gotta show me evidence. The alternative hypothesis was that need to succeed is dependent on anxiety level. Or you could say it in reverse. Anxiety level is dependent on need to succeed. Remember when we talked about independence and dependence and probabilities, you could ask the question either way. So I need to look at a chi-squared distribution. I need to set up the degrees of freedom. And in a test for independence, you take the number of rows minus one times the number of columns minus one. That's our degrees of freedom. Now be very careful, I got a big table here, but these are the total rows. The numbers themselves are these three rows and five columns. So I have three rows and five columns of data. This final column is just a total column, totaling all the rows. This final row is just a row total column, just totaling all the columns. So what I have is three rows and five columns. So in this case, three minus one, five minus one. I have two times four. I have eight degrees of freedom. So I'm gonna be do the chi-squared distribution with eight degrees of freedom. I gotta do my test statistic. And this is what the calculator is going to do for me automatically. The test statistic is take each observed value minus each expected value, square it and divide it by that expected value and add up. That's what the fancy Greek letter stands for, summation. That's a capital Greek sigma. Add up. all 15 of these terms. We're gonna enter our observed data in a table in the calculator. But remember, the calculator thinks in math words. Instead of a table, calculator uses the math word matrix. Sorry, I didn't slide down there nicely. So we're going to enter this observed data right here into a table in the calculator. The table's called a matrix. The calculator will do all the other calculations, the blue calculations, and then the observed minus expected for each box, and then it'll add them together and tell me what the chi-squared is. So let me show you how to enter that on your calculator. <coughs> I can't have the numbers and the paper and the calculator in front of me all at the same time. So I'm gonna switch to the calculator again. 
calculator screen. And the goal is I'm going to get all those blue numbers I wrote down, but the calculator is going to do them, calculating them for me quickly. So let me clear my keystrokes. And let me clear my screen. And I look for this word on the calculator that inputs tables, matrix. It's in the fifth row in the first button, do second function matrix. And a matrix is like a table. So think of these A, B, C, D, E, F, G, I. These are tables that I can put into the calculator. Maybe I'm doing several problems at once. So I wanna edit a table. Just keep using the word table and matrix at the same time. Let's edit matrix A, let's edit table A. Now, in order to edit the table, I have to tell the calculator how big the table is. So how many rows and how many columns? Always say the rows before the columns. I want to make a table of three rows and five columns. Okay, so now the calculator is ready for me and I enter the numbers left to right first row, second row, third row. So I'm gonna enter them quickly, 35. Uh, if you miss one, back up, 35, 42, 53, 15. Make sure you enter these correctly at this stage so you don't have to redo them. 18, sorry, 18. 48, 63, 33, 31. Last row, four, five, 11, 15, 17. I do not have to add the totals for my table, for my matrix. Calculator will take care of the totals. But I do want to scan this to make sure I entered it correctly compared to the numbers I wrote on my paper. So that took me a while to enter, just like it took me a while to write the numbers on the paper. But from here, it's downhill. From here, the calculator is going to do the work. So if I'm happy that I entered all these numbers correctly, I think I am, I am, then we'll just get out of this table. So we're going to quit out of this matrix feature. Let's quit. And now let's go to the stats tests. So hit those. Now let me clear my keystrokes again so you can follow them a little bit easier. Let's go to stats. Slide over to tests. And we're looking for chi-squared test, which is down off the bottom of the screen. Last time we did the goodness of fit test. Today we're just doing the chi-squared test. This is the test for tables of numbers, for matrices of numbers. So I hit enter. Calculator says, what tables do you want me to work on? What matrix do you want me to work on? Now I've put our information into matrix A. So the calculator is saying, where do you want me to put the blue numbers, the expected values? And the calculator says, do you want me to put that into table B? Do you want to put that into matrix B? I say, OK, I'm OK with that. And we can draw this test in a second. But first, I'm going to calculate and write down the results. Here are the results. My test statistic chi-squared is 48.4. One nine nine. That's a very big number as far as test statistic goes. My p value. Now remember how we write this in scientific notation: eight point two one one four times ten to the minus eighth. But how do you write that in human notation? <laughs> That's a tiny, tiny number. Lots of zeros in front of the eight. Three, four, five, six, seven. 
if you want to calculate what 10 to the minus eighth is and you put a zero in front of the dot, you'll write eight zeros. Then you write this number. That's our probability value. Remember what our hypothesis was? Our hypothesis was these two things are independent. That's our null hypothesis. We suspect otherwise. But this p-value is telling me way, way, way otherwise. If these two things are independent, the probability that I would see the numbers that I saw in my survey is tiny, super tiny. Remember, what's my alpha level? What's my level of significance? Well, since they didn't give me one off the bat, I'll choose the ordinary 5% level of significance. And if I compare this p-value to alpha, I'll come back to my calculator in a second, but I'm just writing notes on my paper. If I compare this p-value to alpha, you know, alpha is 5%. This p-value is ridiculously tiny. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight zeros with a dot in between the first two zeros. Eight, two, one, four. No, that p-value is way, way less than 5%. So what happens when the p-value is less than the level of significance? I reject the null hypothesis. There is no way these things seem independent. Now let's say this in English. There is sufficient evidence to support the hypothesis that need to succeed and anxiety level are dependent. Notice how we say this very carefully. There's sufficient evidence to support. I haven't proved anything. I've just taken a survey, but there is sufficient evidence, strong evidence to support the fact that your need to succeed in school is related, dependent on the anxiety level, at least from this survey that I took. Now let's go back to the calculator because I want to show this in a drawing and I want to show you how the calculator automates this. Excuse me, drop my pen. Numbering my papers. So let's pop back to the calculator screen. So this is the test statistic that we wrote down on the paper. We've already agreed that we're going to reject the null hypothesis. Notice how the calculator tells you your degrees of freedom was eight. That's good, it's confirmation. But let's go do that test and look at these matrices A and B. Let's go back to matrix. And do you see, we entered a three by five matrix table in matrix table A. Look at matrix table B is also three by five. Let's look at matrix B. All you have to do is hit enter to look at it. Do you see these numbers? 2209, 2750, 7.41. Those are the same numbers that we wrote in blue in our expected table. In other words, the calculator showed me 
the expected values. It did the calculating for me. Now, if I want to go to mode and cut down on the number of decimal places, let's just do two decimal places. And then show you that calculation again. There, the numbers are rounded off like we wrote them on our paper. I don't like to round it off like this on the screen because I'd like to see the decimals I'm using. So I'm going to go back to format and put it back, sorry, under mode and put it back the way it was. Float or choose the number of decimal places, four, six, eight. Float means calculator uses as many decimal places as it can. Okay, so we see here in matrix B that the calculator did the expected calculations for us. Now let's graph the chi-squared distribution. Now this is going to be, you know, ridiculous coming out here at 48. Remember for a chi-squared distribution, the mean is the same as the degrees of freedom. And the sigma, the standard deviation, is the same as the square root of two times the degrees of freedom. And two times eight is 16, square root is four. So this is a distribution that peaks before eight and then takes a long time to settle down after that. But where is 40, 8, 8, 16, 24, I'm not a great drawer, 32. Let me share my paper with me so you can see what I'm drawing. 40, 48. How much area is under this curve after 48? Well, according to our calculations, a ridiculously small amount of area, but I don't trust myself to draw this very nicely. So let me have the calculator draw this. But the area that I'm looking at is 0 0.1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 zeros, then 8, 2, 1, 1, 4. So now back to calculator and let's redo that test, the chi-squared test, but let's have the calculator draw this for us. The calculator draws it, tries to fit it into a nice window, but I'm not even sure if the calculator is going to go out to 48. Let's try it. I seriously doubt the calculator went out to 48. In fact, the calculator said, this is so close to zero, I'm not even gonna give you a number. It's zero probability. Now, it's not really zero probability, but that's very low probability. It's probably much less than being struck by lightning. Now, here's my chi-squared, 48.4199. Yes, that's what I already saw on my paper. Can I trace this can i see let me i just want to see like where am i in this picture so you look at the x value 10 x value 20 see the calculator stops at 20 if i wanted it to draw it again for me i think i could slide off the right hand side of the screen but it's so ridiculously small, it's not worth it. What I could do is slide over with the arrow key. Oh, calculator won't even let me slide over. So this already 20.5, this is way, way, way tiny. Okay, so back to paper. What did I do? I rejected the null hypothesis. 
and I stated my conclusion. I don't like this example so much because it's like so small, it wasn't even a contest. I'd like to pick something that's maybe a little more competitive. So let's do another example. Where, excuse me, I slide this up. Let's do another example where the test is closer. And I want to do a problem in the book number 89. So 11.3, number 89. Yes, okay, I'll show that one to you. I'll show it to you in the book and then we'll write it all down on the paper. So let me share my book with you. Get over to my book on another screen. Okay, that's, that is the example we just did. Well, similar to the example we just did. We did example 11.7 right here. Need to succeed versus anxiety. Okay, so let's go to the homework problems and find number 89. Okay, here we go. Uh, I'll read this to you. I'm gonna make the screen a little bit larger so I can see it easier. Got it. Some travel agents, here we go. Some travel agents claim that honeymoon hotspots vary depending on the age of the bride. Suppose that they survey 280 recent brides and ask them where they would spend their honeymoon and they collected this information in this table. Now they just, 280 people is a lot, but I guess they focused on some big time locations. Niagara Falls, the Poconos, that's some island I think in the Caribbean. Europe, Virgin Islands also in the Caribbean. Oh no, the Poconos is a mountain range somewhere in the East Coast. Is that in New York? Okay, I'm not super sure about that but it's a mountain range somewhere in the East Coast, like a mountain resort area. So Niagara Falls, Poconos, Europe, Virgin Islands. Virgin Islands is islands in the Caribbean. And then they checked out the 280 brides, putting them in categories of age, 20 to 29, 33, 9, 40, 49, 50 and over. Can we say from this information that the location they would choose is dependent on their age. Maybe the brides that were younger preferred the Virgin Islands. They certainly preferred the Virgin Islands, but is that significantly more than they preferred Niagara Falls? Maybe all brides prefer the Virgin Islands to Niagara Falls. The Virgin Islands was certainly winning in every category but 50 and over. Okay, so what am I going to do? I'm going to enter these numbers in my calculator and I'm going to have the calculator perform a test for independence. Now, what I'm going to do is try to get all of this on the screen at once, uh, the calculator and the homework problem. So that's going to be a little bit of an experiment. and we'll see what happens. This is exercise 89. But it's showing you that the calculator is doing the heavy work for you here. So I am going to shrink down that book picture. I'm going to take that to the place where I have my calculator screen. 
I am going to shrink down my window and let me see if I can have the problem in the book and the calculator running at the same time. This is just an experiment. So give me a second. Let's see how this works. Okay, I think I have the book and the calculator running at the same time here. Very good. You can always uh, chime in if you're not seeing that. And I think I'm recording this that way. Okay, so here we got our table. And notice there's no totals on the bottom or the side. The calculator is going to do the totals for me. We're going to make a matrix, a table. What size table? Four rows, four columns. So let's go to matrix, second function, matrix. Sorry, second function, matrix. Uh, I don't have to erase the ones I used earlier. I'll just write over them. So you go to edit when you want to create a table, four by four. And then the calculator does leave old numbers in there, but you're just going to write over those numbers. So let me get my numbers back in front of me and start typing. Oh, I see my 15. I cannot type and see those numbers at the same time. That's my failure. Okay, let me see if I can adjust the size of the calculator. Okay, let's try it this way. So 15, enter. I'll just start entering them quickly. From right, from left to right, 25, enter, 25. I didn't get 25 on the last one. So make sure you enter what you expected to enter, 25. Sorry, 25, 20. Okay, first row is good. Second row, 15, 25, 25, 10. Third row, 10, 25, 15, 5. Last row, 20, 25, 15, 5. Now you can still write this table out on your paper. It's not that large. But then you got to write out the expected table. That's extra work. And then you got to write out the table where you do the differences squared divided by the expected values. That's too much extra work. So I'm going to double check that I got these numbers in here correctly. And then I'm going to let the calculator do these for me. On my paper, which we'll go back to in a second, I'll write down the test statistic, chi-squared. I'll write down my degrees of freedom. Now remember, four rows, four columns. So I take three times three is nine. Four minus one times four minus one, nine degrees of freedom, test statistic. And let's see what the calculator does. So I leave second function quit, leave the matrix. I'm gonna clear that screen too. Okay, I thought I was clearing this. I'm going to clear the history, sure. But I also want to clear the screen. <laughs> the calculator is fighting me. There, I cleared the screen. Now stats, tests, go all the way down to chi-squared tests. Remember I showed you a trick, is if you want to go down many arrows, try the up arrow and then come up the bottom of the table. So there's the chi-squared test under C. Calculator says, what matrices do you want me to use? And we put the numbers for the honeymoon spots and the ages in matrix A. Put the expected values in matrix B. The calculator will do that for us. And let's calculate the value. Calculator says the test statistic is 15.703. Now let's think about this as far as that distribution goes. Remember, the mu is the degrees of freedom. So mu is nine and the sigma is two times 
mu square rooted. And square root of 18 is a little bit over four. I don't worry too much about that number, but just for the sake of writing it down, let me ask my desk calculator what square root of 18 is. 4.24. So let's call this nine. It's going to peak before nine and then slowly come down afterwards. Nine, four and a quarter is one standard deviation. Two standard deviations, three standard deviations. And that's four and a quarter, right? So this is 13.24. And another standard deviation is 17.48. Remember our test statistics was 15.73. So as this thing is like sliding down now, and this is not a good drawing of a chi-square distribution, it's, but that's what I'm trying to sketch. Let me go back to my paper for a second. 15.703 is gonna be in this territory between 13 and 17. So the area under here is not going to be silly. It's not going to be tiny. Let's find out what that area is. That area is the p-value. And the problem, they did not give me a level of significance to use. So I'm using level of significance. When they don't give it to you, choose 5%. I'll choose my level of significance 5%. And the question is, is this area more than 5% of this whole mound? To me, it looks like it, but I'm not gonna depend on my drawing. I'm gonna ask the calculator what that is. I'll go back to my calculator and screen at the same time. Problem, the calculator says that p-value is 0 0.073334, 0 0.073334, if I round up to four digits, four decimal places. Now compare that to alpha. 0 0.0734 and alpha was 0 0.05. You know what, that's bigger. This is a significant amount of area. Now, what does that mean? That means I cannot reject the null hypothesis. I do not reject the null hypothesis. So, the travel agents want to say, oh, the location they pick for their honeymoon is based on the age of the bride. And I'm going to say, whoa, not so fast. Uh, you haven't shown me any significant evidence of this. That's exactly how I say it. There is no significant evidence, or I could say there is insufficient evidence. to reject my null hypothesis, which was what these are independent. So there's insufficient evidence that honeymoon location location I'm writing this on my paper, so I'll go back to my paper. That honeymoon location and bridal age are dependent. I cannot reject H naught. Now I want to see this visually. So let's go to the calculator and have it draw the good picture of the chi-square distribution. That you could copy that onto your paper if you wanted a really nice picture. I'm going to go back to my desktop 
with the calculator and just do the test again and have the calculator, oh, not the Z test, sorry, chi-squared test. Do the test again. You gotta go down to chi-squared test with matrix A, observe matrix B, but this time instead of calculate, draw. There's the chi-square distribution. And it is a pretty good sized tail. Uh, the calculator drew us a little bit thinner and taller than I did. That's okay. But it says the chi-squared test statistic is 157027, 703, that's what I got. That's what I got from the calculator. It says the probability, the area of this tail, this right tail is 0 0.0734, which is exactly what we wrote down from the other screen. The area there is more than 7%. Since it's more than 7%, and in order to reject the null hypothesis, I had to be less than 5%, I am gonna stick with my conservative view that honeymoon location and bridal age are independent. Nobody has proved to me that they're dependent. Okay, it's a fun test to perform. It's done mostly on the calculator, so that takes some of the work away from you. I do not want you to say you cannot write down these tables. So you can write down the table for these when you do the problem if you like, but don't one at a time calculate the differences. Don't calculate the test statistic one at a time. That takes too much work. Okay. You could also do this on a spreadsheet if you wanted to automate this, and that would also reduce the work, but your calculator is preset to do this. Okay, I'm only going to say, now that, that's what we wanted to check. Uh, and I'm looking at comments about the class of cars. <laughs> yeah, I could probably be happy with several cars. <laughs> so uh, anyway, this is what we want to do this week with one exception. I want to show you our web page to make sure that I set you up for next week. But the two homework problems you're going to do this week are from 11.2 and 11.3. So the problems that we've demonstrated this week in our class recordings. Let's go to our web page for just a second so that I can Oh, excuse me, I got to get my screens together. Show you the next topic we're going to jump into. Okay, got that ready. Let me share this browser window with you. Uh, Microsoft Edge browser. I'm kind of a Macintosh person, but Microsoft Edge browser seems okay. Safari, Edge, those are the two I use. Like I already said to everybody in the class once that I'm not a fan of Google Chrome. Anyway, here we are in semesters and we are saying we're in Math 208. Got it, got it, got it. And in week 13, we were doing 11, 1, 11, 2, and 11, 3. And your homework, number 10, if you bring this up, if you haven't downloaded already after you handed in the test last night, it's from 11, 2, and 11, 3. These are just problems from the book about 11, 2, and 11, 3. One of them, ice cream flavors and regions of the country. I was upset with the ice cream flavors because I mean, my favorite ice cream was chocolate chip and I don't, mint chip, I just don't get it. But if I can't have chocolate chip, I'll have chocolate. But chocolate chip to me is the best ice cream. It's hard to find. It's not it's just not one of the big time favorites, I guess. But I do want you to look at these other two things that I want you to read this week about linear equations and scatter plots. 
So the idea here is what we're going to start next week is a different way to compare two sets of data. And I'll just show you a quick example on paper, because you have some ex experience with what a line is. Sure, that's what a linear equation is. But what's a scatter plot? And what happens when the dots don't line up? That's the question. So I go back to my paper. And let me raise this paper up a little bit. So a linear equation is when someone says to you something like, uh, two plus three X. And then you lay down some dots. When I choose X, I get this Y. And you can choose the values for X, calculate the values for Y. X is zero. If X is zero, Y is two. If X is one, Y is two plus three. If X is two, Y is two plus six. And you can go on and on. Notice every time I increase the X by one, I triple that one and increase the Y by three. So that three right there is telling me how the y's are increases when the x is increased by one. So I could even predict uh, next time, sorry, eight, six plus two is eight. Next number should be 11. Next number should be 14. If you put three times four, it's 12 plus two, you get 14. I can't draw all these dots because some of them are going to go off my scale. But if I just draw the ones I can, one and five, two and eight, three and 11. I'm trying to draw this very neatly and very regularly. So when you do drawing of a line like this, it's important to make your scale regular, both axes, not necessarily the same scale, and to make your dots count. So why is this called a linear equation? Well, in the very silliest sense, because all the dots line up. <laughs> all the dots live on a straight line. And you've learned some vocabulary words associated with this. The y-intercept, where this line crosses the y-axis. That's that two right here. Two is the y-intercept. What's this three represent? This three represents the fact that every time I go over one, I go up three. One over three up. This three to one ratio is called slope. So somewhere you may have heard these words y intercept two, slope three. Now that's what happens when dots line up. But I could make points to plot out of anything. Maybe I could plot your age here on the horizontal axis and your height here on the vertical axis. I'm sure that as you grow older, your height increases. But that's only up to a point, right? And I don't think that every 16 year old is the same height, that every 42 year old is the same height. So you could have different people, same age, different heights. You could have different people, same height, different ages. 
So I don't want to talk about age and height necessarily. I mean, that's, I need a lot of people to put together. But, but the idea here is, what if I just gave you some X and Y points that did not line up? Let's just pick some numbers like uh, one, three, five, six, seven, and then pick some Y values like, oh, there's no reason it can't go this way. 10, eight, seven, three, four. Let me mark these points really carefully on this graph. So I'll make marks for one, two, three, four, five, six. What's called, I'm doing right now is marking my scale with the dashes and then labeling my scale with these numbers. I don't have to label every single number, but just enough to, you can see what I'm talking about. Now let's label this axis here. Two, four, six, eight, 10, this will be my Y, this will be my X. Now I mark these dots, one and 10, three and eight, five and seven, six and three, seven and four, now this, uh, I was using a blue ink pen there. The blue ink doesn't show up excellent on the camera, but it probably show up when I copy the papers. What do you say about those lines? They do not line up. There is no doubt that those points do not line up. When you graph just a bunch of points that someone gives you comparing two lists of data, it's called a scatter plot. This is a scatter plot. But even though the points don't line up, I got a feeling that the farther out I go, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, the lower the Y values are maybe. It seems like even if they don't line up, there's a trend. And so the idea is, is there a way for me to measure that trend or discover that trend? And I agree that there's no line that fits those five dots. But is there an idea that one line fits them better than any other? That's a strange idea. If I say connect these points, you say, I can't connect these points. I say, well, do the best you can. But, and then you start connecting them like stars in the sky with line segments. I say, no, no, I mean, best you can. Draw me one line that gets as close as you can. And then maybe, okay, I'll do that one. But then your friends also checking this out. And your friend says, no, I don't agree with you. I'm thinking this line is better. That's green. How are we gonna settle that argument? You know, you, to you, the blue one is obviously the best you can do. And your friend says, no, you're ridiculous. That blue one is not good. The green one is the best we can do because I think they slant more out. How do we settle that argument? How do we find the line that fits best? That's what we're gonna do now in chapter 12. Now the two sections in chapter 12 that are on your book right now, in your week 13 right now, are just introducing these words. Next week, I'll show you how to find the line that fits best. And you're within your rights to say, I don't think any line fits best. I don't think there's any best line. And I say, you know, that's an acceptable point of view uh, I felt that way once too. But there actually is a formula for the line that fits best using statistics. And it's also programmed in your calculator. Maybe you've even seen it before. But I want to convince you next week that there is a line that is the best one. And then it's not hard to calculate 
with the statistics. In your calculator, you can also calculate it by hand. Okay, that's where I'm gonna leave it this week. So this is, I'm just introducing you to words like the author, she introduced you to the same words in section 12.1 and 12.2. You can read 12.1, 12.2 is very short. Okay, I'm gonna get the recording posted. I'm going to get uh, these papers posted. I'm gonna start reading your exams and get them back to you later this week, maybe beginning of next week. But, and Tigers are off to a good start too. I am happy about that. Um, so listen, Tiger game, it's probably a Tiger game going on right now. And have a good weekend. I will see you later. Thanks for coming.